wonder if the prime minister were to reach out to you, Mr. Siegel, and say, hey, we could really use your help if we're moving forward with this basic income idea. What would you suggest to him and why would you suggest that it's important? Well, first of all, um, I have been asked for help by various premiers on this issue. I've never let partisanship get in the way of being supportive. When any first minister asks for your help, I think it's a privilege and an honor to be constructive and helpful in that respect. And the case I would make to the prime minister is as follows. If you're really interested in a society where there's genuine equality of opportunity, then I think we have to be very, very clear about what poverty does to the 10% of Canadians who live beneath the poverty line. That's essentially three and a half million of our fellow citizens. What it does to their health, how poverty is a perfect predictor of that health, what it does to their kids' chances in terms of making progress in school, what it does in terms of problems like substance abuse or even difficulty with the law. And the most effective investment we can make, and the government has done some of this with the child benefit program to their credit, is to reduce poverty, to invest in that, because the returns would be quite substantial. And I would urge him to respond to premiers like the premier of Prince Edward Island, who's written them a letter, to say they've had an all-party discussion in Prince Edward Island. They'd like to move ahead with a basic income in that province. Uh, The same is true of Newfoundland and Labrador. These are two liberal uh, premiers in the sense that there's a progressive conservative in PEI who's a red Tory, but he has support from all the parties. And I would say to the prime minister, if you really, really want to make progress, that'll be one of those legacy projects which will change the country for the better in the same way as health insurance did coming out of Saskatchewan in uh, in the 60s, and Mr. Pearson's work on that, this would be the way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about the costs, sir, because as I'm sure that you've heard, every time this conversation comes up, people express concern about how you pay for it, because it is expensive. The parliamentary budget officer put the price tag of such a program on a federal level to be about $85 billion in 2021 to 22, rising to $93 billion between 2025 and 26. So how do we pay for this? It's a lot of money. Well, we have to look at both sides of the ledger. So there is a growth cost, which the parliamentary budget office has said would be about $85 billion. That's absolutely correct. But remember, this would replace $30 billion in uh, provincial welfare programs, which are now being spent inefficiently and in a way that doesn't produce any constructive results. So that takes the price down to $50 billion. That does not count what would happen if things like the low-income tax credit for the HFT and others were replaced, because this would be a more efficient way to do that. When you look at all that, when you look at the fact that Most of the people who show up in the emergency ward in the non-COVID time are people with chronic diseases, which are produced by poverty, by a bad diet, and by by insufficient housing. We, in fact, probably get the real price down to about 20 or 30 billion a year. That's about 10%, Natasha, of the total fiscal package for Canada in a non-COVID year. Taking 10% of our total revenue and investing that in reducing the pathologies of poverty and the implications that it has for all of us. Remember this, during this COVID period that we've all been through, the areas of the country and of every community that have been hit the hardest are the ones where the low-income population is most concentrated. They've gotten sick sooner. They've been uh, more infected as other, than other parts of the population. They've had more serious outcomes and, sadly, a higher fatality rate. So there are costs to all of us of not investing and in reducing poverty as best we can. When we talk about the issue of poverty, sir, often it becomes a conversation not of poverty, but of the poor. And I've done a few interviews recently about universal basic income or guaranteed basic income. And the response from many people is, well, people don't work hard enough and we are supposed to have a free market society and you're going to make people lazy and you're not going to give them motivation to work hard. What is the appropriate response to those arguments that say some people inherently don't want to work? Well, I've been a lifelong progressive conservative, so I believe in the value of work. I believe in the value of taking risk. I believe in the value of productivity and everybody doing their share. That being said, the vast majority of people who are living in poverty today inherited that circumstance from their parents, not because of their own laziness that they ended up in poverty. And we know that our welfare system, which operates now 
actively discourage his work. If you get welfare in Ontario, which is about six or seven hundred dollars a month, that's half the rate necessary to get by, half the rate of poverty, and should you earn another couple of hundred dollars a month, that money that you get from welfare will be tax back a dollar per dollar. So it's a huge disincentive to work. The basic income would not be that disincentive. It would be a top up. It would help people get by, especially low income members of the, of the working poor. Let's remember, when we had our difficulties, as we still have in our long-term care facilities, some of that was caused by low paid workers without sick leave at a very low level of pay. They were the working poor who had to work in different places in order to make a living, and they became innocent vectors of the virus. So um, I believe that if you give everybody, as you give everybody a basic education and you make sure we have health capacity for everybody in normal time, we have to make sure that no one is given such a disadvantage at birth that they can't work their way out and become active members of the of, the, of our population. And that's kind of what I believe is a conservative. Well, on that point, sir, if you'll permit me, your 2020 book, the title was uh, Bootstraps Need Boots. And then the subquote was One Tory's Lonely Fight to End Poverty in Canada. So why have you been that lonely Tory? And so even the Conservative Party now, we just heard from leader O'Toole yesterday who said, who was critical of the idea of a universal basic income when the Liberals and the NDP and the Green all seem to be on board with this idea, why do you think the Conservative Party is resistant to it? Well, look, um, I, I guess my instinct is that they are desperate to find points of difference between themselves and the resolutions passed at the Liberal Party. That's a natural instinct in our politics. It's not necessarily subversive or bad. But in this circumstance, I think they're going against some pretty fundamental conservative principles. Conservatives do not believe in equality of outcome. Some of our socialist friends do on occasion. We believe in equality of opportunity. And when you look at the fact that the largest single group of those living beneath the poverty line are black, indigenous, and people of color who face other issues because of that poverty, the notion that a conservative or a liberal or any other rational political actor would not try to diminish those constraints and so that people can participate in our society, which strikes me as profoundly, simply un-Canadian. Okay. Hugh Siegel, it has been my pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you, Natasha. Hugh Siegel is a former Conservative Senator and helped design the Ontario Basic Income Pilot Project.